Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover any um, items that may be of interest to librarians across the state. We do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time and they are recorded so you can watch any of our sessions if you want to um, on our archive sessions page here. Um, this morning it is our once a month, not necessarily every four weeks, but once a month, once a month. <laughs> Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, um, who's got some things he's going to share with us, and he's got a, we have a guest speaker as well, um, but first he wants to pop over and talk about something. Yep. Um, so. All right. Thanks. Yep. I'm, I'm Michael. Hello again. Uh, you've been hearing a lot from me lately. At least it feels like it. Um, <laughs> Usually I do links and news stories at the end, but um, I'm going to do one first now, and then I'll do some more at the end if we have time after our, our guest. Um, but, uh, Chris, if you want to click on that very first link there, um, I don't... Oops. What? That's interesting. Okay, well, the link didn't work. Um, <laughs> you want to find another link real quick for me? I'm sure somebody's got it out there somewhere. Um, about 90 minutes ago, um, news hit the Twittersphere and other places. Um, Amazon is announcing that they are going to be working with OverDrive to loan, um, to work with libraries to loan Kindle-based books through uh, OverDrive through libraries. Um, I don't have, well, any one of those will do. We don't really need the, the actual press release. We're trying to link to the press release, um, but that'll do. We don't have really any details at this point. Um, a lot of folks on Twitter are trying to get a hold of uh, folks at Overdrive, um, are trying to ask some questions about, you know, we're going to have to buy separate versions. There's the news release. Um, because Kindle books aren't EPUB, and Overdrive's been doing EPUB, and EPUB won't work on Kindle. Um, we don't know how it's going to work. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. They're saying this fall. Um, Just announced in like the last hour. Yeah, literally this morning since, since we came in. So I wouldn't necessarily start running out and telling all of your patrons that have Kindles, woohoo, we're going to get, you know, library books are going to start working with Kindles. I would just keep an eye on this story. Um, search like Amazon Kindle libraries or OverDrive, you, you'll, you'll see that the results Krista had there up on the screen a moment ago. Um, that is just it, it, breaking news. I, I, I don't think this could have happened any sooner before uh, uh, we started our recording here today. So, the most they have for days yeah. is available later this year. Yeah. So, yeah, whatever. Right. Just announced. So um, and, and last I heard, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, marketing person for Overdrive was unavailable for Comet, so... Um, he's too busy. He's too busy, probably. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we'll keep you posted. Uh, you know, if you're here in Nebraska, I'm sure um, Susan with the, the Overdrive program here is following this story. We'll figure out what's going on. We'll let everybody know as we can, but just wanted to, to let everybody know about that one. Yeah. So, you know, as up-to-date as we can. Okay, so um, with that, uh, what I want to do is... Um, Say hello to Jennifer Korber. Jennifer, are you there? I am here. Do you hear Yay! Me? <laughs> Jennifer, for the for uh, regular viewers, is um, <laughs> was, was has been on our last two live from conference uh, sessions, um, and is with the Boston Public Library, and she's going to talk to us about uh, online personas today. And and uh, Jennifer knows I'm probably going to have some loaded questions for her because she and I have had many a discussion. We, 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 we differ on, on some opinions about some of these issues. Uh, so, Jennifer, I will let you introduce yourself, and we're, while we do that, we'll just uh, hand over um, uh, control here, and you can uh, give us your talk. So, I'm suddenly realizing, Michael, we should have compared better notes. <laughs> I have two talks about personas. Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. One about, one about creating personas for back-end website design and, um, you know, creating user personas. And that's actually the one that I had prepared for today. On the other hand, I do have my other presentation available, and I can switch over to it if you'd like me to. Well, so, no, well, um, so it, uh, probably my fault. Stick with whatever the description you sent us. <laughs> Yes, this is the description. Okay, okay, so yes, my mistake. Yes, okay, yes, go okay. With that. 
absolutely. I say, right, we can have you on another one. time to do the other one. <laughs> yep. I will totally come back for the other one. <laughs> um, so just to make sure that this is the creating user personas for um, websites. Websites. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My mistake. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, this is what happens when you're when you're also you know um, professional contacts with the folks that you're presenting with, and you talk about so many different ideas and you talk about so many different concepts that at some point the the, the language all mixes together and you're never sure what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead at that point and then show my whoops, uh -huh. show my screen, which then. Uh, Okay, now there we go. See me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there we go. We see your presentation. You're all good. Excellent. Uh, so, hi everybody, and uh, thank you so much. By the way, it is very good that I was muted during your announcement, Michael, because um, I believe uh, this is a, a rated PG or G show, and my reaction to hearing that Amazon and OverDrive have finally gotten t started talking together uh, made me very excited. BPL <laughs> <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, I wonder if we had some of the reactions okay. from other people. I am thrilled. <laughs> you have a kid. <laughs> well, then it's a good thing everybody was muted. <laughs> uh, I have a witch. I missed out. You have a Kindle? I do, uh, but it's on permanent loan. Um, <laughs> but we also, I didn't actually pay for it. It's just mine right now while I'm playing with it and testing it and seeing if I like it. Um, but we also have lots of nooks in the audience as well, and so uh, we've been doing all sorts of training and testing with that sort of thing. So, um, But okay, yeah. let's get going, and uh, thank you all for coming. The personas that I'm going to talk about today are on, and you know what, I'll just run through this quickly, and then we can also talk about um, other kinds of personas. The first kind of persona that I'm talking about today is... Um, the kind of persona you create if you're trying to develop either a new website or a new, um, uh, new service, a new program, a new marketing campaign, uh, or a new building, a new library building. These kinds of personas represent your users. And they let you focus on and keep a focus on who you're trying to design this program or service for. And this is a term that actually comes out of marketing. And so you might have heard this in term, you know, in uh, in terms of marketing speak of you know who are your users, who are you designing these things for. And what we've found is that it can be incredibly useful to have these images up in front of you, and these um, user personas up in front of you anytime you're trying to do anything really for people other than yourself. And you know, here in libraries, we're doing all sorts of programs and for people other than ourselves, and so it's good to have these concepts in in front of you. Um, by the way, I am from Boston. I am, however, also a native New Yorker, so I talk very quickly, um, and in an online presentation like this, that's even harder. So, Krista, if at any point anybody is saying, she's talking too fast, uh, please let me know. I, I will, no stuff. problem. <laughs> um, but let's get going. <laughs> so what are... There we go. What are personas? The jargony version is a persona is an archetype serving as a surrogate for an entire group of real people. Okay, great. So what does that actually mean? It means that you can create a character that becomes the face and voice of people who are your users. Uh, this is a campaign that's been going around. Um, I've seen it everywhere in Boston over the past year or so. Um, and these two characters, it's uh, fertility, which is not the greatest example for me to use for libraries, but um, it is a great campaign as far as creating user personas because you have these two characters who are very clear and they have uh, Neil and Karen, they have stories, they have little video clips that they, um, they've they shot with these two characters talking about why they need this service, what their background is, what their, what their story is, really. And these stories, like I said, give faces and voices to your, to your users as you're trying to design services for them. And they keep you, having user personas keep you focused outside instead of inside your own head. 
And you can do this by having just little phrases, little catchphrases, the, um, the watch Neil and Karen box, those are all links to videos that tell little pieces of their story. And um, on the right hand, one, to, one out of eight couples have difficulty conceiving. This is again another piece of that story. Who, who is this marketing campaign talking to? Not who's talking, but who's, who is it talking to and why and what will be important to them? And this, again, is a marketing campaign, but we use it in libraries to determine, to figure out, you know, our programs. Who is going to be coming to this program? What need of theirs is it going to serve? How is it going to contribute to their lives? We have to think, of, we think of all these things, and we don't know that we're thinking about them, but this is what we're doing. And user personas just take that, that process that we go through kind of in the back of our heads and make it a little bit more formal and give it a little bit more structure so that we can really look at who our users are and what we're doing for them and why and then do even more and make even better services and, pro and programs and websites and buildings. So what do personas do? Personas can bring focus to a design process. Uh, they remind you that your users are in fact real people. They encourage consensus um, because now that you're talking about not the people in a room who are trying to decide what to do and how to do it, but you're talking about people who are outside this room. You're talking about Bob. You're talking about Karen. You're talking about Neil. You're not talking about anybody who's right there. You're talking about these other users who are represented by these characters. Um, and all of a sudden, it's not just about the people in the room who might have disagreements on how things should be. It's about other people. And that can actually help people agree when they might not always. And that sounds very confusing, but I'll, I'll clarify that in a little bit. Um, and by encouraging consensus, it can lead to efficient decision making and therefore better decisions. Um, when a team, you know, when a team reviews personas early on in the process, everybody is forced to think about the audience and the features up front, and they're less likely to, you know, ch less likely to have changes later that will make the whole process take longer and be less efficient and have to go back and fix things later because you didn't think of, you know, what m what people might be using this service for or how people might be attending this program ahead of time. Um, so. Okay, great. Now we know what, why personas are needed. What are they? What's in them? What, what do they consist of? And as I said, they are character descriptions that represent real people. So they represent the real people we're trying to design a, a program or a service or a website for. And so you do everything that's necessary to make that character as real as possible. You start, you give them a picture, give them an image. Don't use somebody you know. Uh, don't use anybody who, who's in the department. Don't use anybody's relatives. Uh, just because you want this to be any of your users. This is a single voice and face, but it needs to represent anybody. So use some you know, stock photo from somewhere and give them a face. Give them a, uh, go on and then give them a name, give them an age neighborhood, family members, you know, all those real details that any real person would have. And once you've got a good sense of the person, start thinking about their goals. What do they want from your service? What do they want from your library? What do they want from you? What do they want from your building, your website? Whatever it is, how are they going to act once they're there? What behaviors are they go going to have, you know? You've got someone who's a mom with two young kids. She's going to come into your library and have a very different way of moving through the library than a, a business per, young business person who's there on their lunch break. Those two people are going to use your library and your programs and your services in very different ways. And so by creating a user persona for each of them, you can design and think about what's important to one versus what's important to another. And that helps you make decisions on your end when you're trying to design 
everything from a website to a program to the front entrance way. Um, I was recently working with an architectural student who was designing a library and user personas became vital because this person is, you know, young 20-something architectural student, had no idea who used a library and how in a public library. And so by giving, them, giving him a list of personas, a list of these characters, I was able to give him an idea of who would be using that building. And that made his process much clearer because now he could look at his design at any point and say, oh, I need to create this kind of an entranceway and this kind of a connection between the children's room and the circulation desk because this mom is going to come in and use this building this way versus I need to create, you know, put the computer rooms over here because this is where the young business person coming in quickly on a lunch break to check e personal email is going to come in. Um, same thing with a website. Once people get to your home page, if they get to your home page, how they um, start out and where they go next on your website will de be determined by who they are and how they want to use that thing. So when you're creating your personas during the design process, you create these characters to be those represent you know to, to represent those uses. And so once you've got kind of a name, a face, an age, um, a story, now you start talking about their goals and behaviors. What are they coming to do, and how are they going to do it? Um, you can also go into their experience and education levels if it's important for academic libraries. You know you're talking about the difference between how an undergrad how an incoming freshman will use your library and its website versus how a graduate student will use your library and its website versus how the professors will versus how the staff will. All of those folks have different ways of using our programs and services. Um, and similarly, you can give them a story. If you, if you want to, f those are kind of the basics. And then you can start fleshing those personas out uh, with a story, with quotes, and any other details that will help make them real to you. So for instance, on the left, you've got two different personas uh, with picture, name, short description up at the top, and then additional details down at the bottom. And some of them are quotes from them, some of them are descriptions, kind of third person descriptions. On the right, you have it as a map. Uh, this is a someone who's using a vacation planning website. And on the left is all of the um, places that they're going to, that they have to think about as they're trying to, to plan their vacation. On the right are the people who influence them. Um, and the description is in the middle. And it's very short and very brief, but very necessary. Um, and so a persona could look like the one on the left. It could look like the one on the right. If you're looking for something a little bit quicker, a persona could just be a paragraph of description. This is a lot of text. No need to read it. Um, you'll be getting a link to the presentation later. But it basically describes what a self-sufficient power user of a library would be. This is one that I wrote for that architectural student I mentioned earlier. Um, and it just really, it's kind of encapsulated in the first sentence. It would be wrong to claim that these users just want a book ATM because the brief interaction with library staff is deeply appreciated, but they want to be in and out in five minutes or less. And that's a very short uh, description of that person who is coming in to use your library or who is coming to use your library website or to attend a program. They want to be quick, streamlined, in and out, and fast. If even this is too long, you can distill that very same thing down to a single sentence or a group of phrases. And uh, Michael, the architectural student, took all of the personas that I gave him, which were all those paragraphs, and streamlined them all the way down to just a quick phrase to remind him of who those users are. So there's that self-sufficient power user, in and out in five minutes, streamlined minimalist. And you can just see some of the other um, types of personas that I came up with him. Uh, and you can use catchy phrases if, like I said, I was doing this very quickly, you, it's much better to use actual names and to get, make them real people. Um, I was trying to be a little bit broader and just go by the types of activities that they'd be doing or the types of needs that they would have. So 
who are your users? Now, you might think that you know who your users are. You might have a very strong idea in your head that these are your users, these are the people you see every day. And you're, you're quite likely right in a lot of ways because, you know, I've been out, uh, I'm, I'm now behind the scenes, but for 12 years I was a branch, a librarian in a branch library, um, everything from a children's librarian to an acting branch manager. And so I interacted with our public every single day. And I thought I knew who our users were, but I also knew that there were lots of people that I, I wasn't interacting with and either who never came into the library at all or who never talked to me. So my idea of who my users were was just the starting point of who was actually using the library and its services. Because the bigger the library and the, the bigger the, the town or the city or the academic institution or school or what have you or company, the the more diverse your users are going to be and the less likely it is that you actually know who they all are or what types of users they are. Um, but the single most important thing to remember is that you, library staff, are not your users, particularly for things like the main library website and the programs and services and the building of the library itself. We are some of our users, but we staff are not our primary users. Our primary users are either our public in general, the members of the company that we work for, or the students and faculty and staff of the academic institution we work for. Those are our users and those are the people that we have to design these services for. So how do we develop personas to figure out who our users are and how we can design programs and services and websites for them? Well, first of all, you do know who some of your users are. You have that idea. So you brainstorm with staff. You brainstorm and talk to people and generate some ideas of who your users are and who the, what those personas might be. Um, and you start this by uh, just you know, coming up with ideas. That's what I did for, that, for the architectural student was just brainstorm from my own experience because I had a fairly diverse experience and I felt pretty confident and he also needed it very quickly. You can also collect data, qualitative data, quantitative data, both um, talking to people and also getting hard numbers. What are your actual you know, traffic patterns in your buildings? How many people visit your website? What times of day do they visit your website? All of those analytics that we can get off of our websites are good for getting um, persona information about who uses our websites and the statistics we've all been collecting for years uh, to submit to state and uh, federal organizations for how our libraries work. Um, all of those statistics are useful in, all those demographic statistics and use statistics are good to identify users that way. Um, once you've started collecting data and gotten some ideas, you can start looking at unique behaviors and goals. Because there are some tasks, you know, checking the catalog or checking hours that are, everybody needs to be able to do them and everybody needs to be able to do them easily. Um, for, for programs, you know, you're always going to have a story time of some kind. The question is, if you're a public library, if you're doing, if you're in an academic, you're going, always going to have some kind of bibliographic instruction. What's important is to pick out for your user personas what's unique about those users, what behaviors they have, what goals they have that makes them different from everybody else who needs some kind of bibliographic instruction or everybody else who needs a story time or everybody else who needs to check the hours of your library on your website. Those, those unique behaviors and goals are what distinguish your user personas one from the next. And so now you can start taking all this data and all of this information and start splitting them out into groups based on those unique behaviors and goals. And then see what's similar and what's common amongst all of them and write a, pers a persona description for each of them. And you want to try and have as few as possible. Um, for the academic institution I mentioned earlier, I, I identified undergrads, grads, um, undergrads, grads, faculty, and staff. Those are, and you might also have alums, alumni, and 
trustees or other stakeholders involved, and that's six personas, and that's, that's a fair size. That's a good size. You don't want to get too, too large. We, we tried to do a, a website redesign for the BPL a few years ago, and we ended up with 14 personas, and that was just far, far too many. Because on the one hand, it showed us that we were really trying to serve a lot of people, but on the other hand, we were trying to do it all at the same time, and that meant that the website, if we had actually been redesigning at that point, would have just been a mess. Um, and it wouldn't have been useful to anybody because we would have tried to make it useful to everybody. You want to really streamline it and get it as get down to as few personas as you can. Um, because you're, you'll see that a lot more people have those functions in common, and those become the base functionality of your site or your or your building or you know what you have in every single program. And then once you've got some persona descriptions written, you test them and refine them and see if they actually work. And then if not, you go back and fix them a little bit and get them to work better. So to break this out a little bit further, to develop personas, you brainstorm with staff. And this is acquiring that data. This is a, where you get the, the information that you're going to create your personas with. Um, you're going to talk with current users. You can talk with, do it through user interviews, formal, in, formal, informal. You can use surveys, all those surveys we've been collecting all these years. Um, any usability testing, if you're doing a website, that usability testing may show you some changes in your user personas. And particularly for buildings or programs, just go watch. Go watch people move through your buildings. Go watch them as they're in programs. Don't be, not, not when you're presenting a program, not when you're try, the person doing it, but as someone else is doing it. Watch the people who are using that program or who are using that service and just observe them and listen to them. Listen to the language. Listen to what they talk about. Listen to how they talk about what's going on. Pull words from there. Pull words from comments. If you've got blogs, look at the comments there. Look at emails that get sent in to the webmaster um, or to the library. Uh, anything that comes through on a feedback form from reference calls and reference questions. All of those places give you language and word choices that your users are using to talk about your library and its services. And that can help you make choices when you go to make a sign or to make a website or to do anything else that requires using language because now you can start using the same language they're already using. And that will make it easier for your users to use your ser service or site. Um, and then, of course, you can always get quanti quantitative data from web analytics, demographic studies, census reports, reference statistics, program statistics, um, marketing statistics, if you've got those, uh, any of those kind of really hard number crunchy datas, data. Um, and when you're listening, you can also get folks to talk about their lives outside the library, not just when they're there, but also what they do outside. Because this is where you get your new ideas from. Programs and services, website elements that you haven't tried yet because you didn't know that that was a need. If you get folks to talk about their lives outside the library and outside of what they already come to do, that's where you can figure out where your new products and services come from, new programs and services. Um, and Again, yes, this all sounds very, very uh, marketing-y and advertising-y, and that's okay because we're, we're taking these ideas and then seeing how it's useful for libraries and how we can take this, this idea of looking at the people who come into our libraries and who use our services and really getting to understand them on their level, not just what we already think about them. You, you can be very surprised by this when you go through this process. And this is just, in case you're a visual learner, this just puts everything that I just talked about into a graph. And your goals, um, you can see from the qualitative, the data, hard numbers down at the bottom, to qualitative data up at the top, insights, language, um, and from goals and attitudes and what people say to what they actually do. And all of those different ways of getting data will uh, give you different kinds of information that you can then use to create your user personas.
So as a little quick test of everything we've thought about so far, now, I usually do this in person, uh, so I'm just going to give you a second. Who's this? If this person walked into your library, what would you think about them? What do you think their story would be? What do you think they would want from you? What do you think they would, what sorts of services or programs or other stuff might they want? Just take a, a second or two to, to think about this. Get a good look at them. Well, well, we were wondering, is the sax with him when he comes in the library? <laughs> it might be. I, I did, in fact, have a uh, young woman, a uh, group of kids, come, kids, they were in their 20s, um, come in, and one of them had a guitar, and out, out of the case in the whole nine yards, and mm -hmm. she ended up playing the guitar very, very quiet. Yeah, she ended up uh, very quietly playing the guitar in the back of the library. It was a Saturday morning, 9 a.m., nobody was there. I was perfectly happy with it. It was a wonderful way to wake up. <laughs> um, we'll also assume she had some talent. Oh, yes. She was yeah. quite good. <laughs> and I can say with experience that so is this guy. Because uh, now that you've all kind of gotten a sense of who he might be and, and what he might want, I would, eh, there we go. I would like you to meet Chuck. Uh, this is Chuck Lashane. And Chuck is the creator, impresario, grandmaster flash of a local um, marching band that I am proud to know and I'm proud to call Chuck a friend of mine. And Chuck is a young guy who mostly does computer type stuff during his day job, but he has basically built up a band, a marching band, with about 15 people in it. Um, that goes around, does parades, does, um, they do weddings, they do events, they've had large, pro you know, large performances in clubs, um, and they're an activist marching band, so they're very inclined towards social justice, so they've gone out and done fundraising, and they've done, you know, you'll see them at Wake Up the Earth, and at other large, kind of socially active, um, outside events, and so Chuck, and he's also created something called the Boston Circus Guild, which is a kind of a clearinghouse for local independent circus acts, people who do hula hooping and uh, juggling and fire, fire uh, juggling and fire spinning and all sorts of other fun circus-y type uh, activities. And he will, the Boston Circus Guild will let people contact you know, people who want those sorts of performers at their events, and they'll come in and, and hire them out through the Boston Circus Guild. So what person who might have looked like some scruffy dude coming in, all grimy and greasy with a saxophone, and he might have been raising a little bit of uh, a ruckus, is actually a young entrepreneur who needs business plan information, who needs business research, who needs marketing information and marketing research, uh, who may need contact information for other organizations that do the sorts of things that he does in other cities and in other parts of the country and the world, and he may need um, just general conflict management, how do you deal with employees, how do you deal with other people sorts of resources. And as, as I said, I do in fact know all this for sure. Um, you'll see Chuck there, he is performing a wedding with the rest, with a good portion of the stationary marching band. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, that person on the left holding the banner in the top hat might, well, to Michael will look very, and Krista will look very familiar, uh, but to all y'all, that's me. So I, I know for sure that these are the sorts of things that Chuck is looking for when he comes in. Um, I include this example because when you first see a scruffy looking dude with a saxophone, young guy, you might think that he's in there to do all sorts of things having nothing to do with any, anything that libraries have to deal with. And in truth, he is a perfect user of public libraries and of the resources that we have to provide. So that, that's my, you never know who your users are until you actually start paying attention to them on a very intimate level, uh, spiel. So I've mentioned all of this uh, at the beginning and I'm gonna go back and review what are these personas good for, all this stuff that I've been talking about. Um, you can use them if you are either building a new library, if you are renovating a library, if you are renovating a section of a library, if you're just buying new furniture, 
if you're trying to you know new, do new interior decorating, um, any type you're any time you're you're creating or changing a physical space in your library, if you create some personas, you can come up with different ways that those folks might be using those spaces. Uh, this is more from our previously mentioned architectural student. Um, his thesis book actually should be coming out shortly. Um, but he used those personas to talk about the various program elements and, and parts of the library that he then designed for. And he had these great conceptual models that he took all of those uses and just started breaking them off into neat, into neat ways of how people might be using the building. You create personas for digital spaces. Who is sitting at the other end of that computer using your website or using your online resources and your databases or your downloadable audio and video and, and ebooks? Who is out there using those services and those programs? Um, people are doing online storytelling and online story time. Um, who's sitting at the other end, Michael and Krista, of your your video cast? You know, who are your users? Who are you trying to create this? encompass for. Those are all different ways you can use personas at the other end of a digital space. You can use personas to design programs, computer training programs, uh, story times, as I said, bibliographic instruction, um, uh, workshops, programs of all sorts when you're trying to decide, you know, with our limited, increasingly limited resources, which are your, which program performers do you want to bring in and use those limited resources to, to get? Um, you can use this process to, to choose and use your money wisely. Um, and then brainstorming, uh, uh, sorry, and then personas for marketing, again, this started off as a marketing tool and it still is a good one. So I'm going to, I'm checking the time and I'm realizing it's uh, about 11.42, so I think we'll skip the two exercises, but I'm just going to show you what they are, just to show you how easy it can be to come up with some very basic personas. You could quite literally just take a minute, brainstorm possible personas or groups of users, and just come up with you know groups of your users who you get out of your own head. Um, because like I said, we do have a lot of experience, many of us have been in the field for quite some time, and we do have a, a a good first sense of who our users are. So that experience is a great starting point for coming up with personas. Um, and really try to focus on real users, people you've actually interacted with, not just people you think might be using your services. And then you can just take one's persona, just as a practice, give them a name, give them a face, give them a story. Again, not an actual person, but now create a new character who represents all of the users who are like that person. So all of the, the moms with young children who, or dads with young children or caregivers with young children who are coming in to use your library for stories and for story times and programs. And how would they use your library? How would they use the website? How would they use your programs and services? And then how can you serve them? How can you create that? Um, and again, what's in a persona? The photo, just to give them a face, give them descriptions, give them details, make them real. And then figure out, once they've become a real person to you, figure out what they want and how they're going to get it from you. Give them a story, give them some words, and give them anything else that will make them real. And that process, the process of creating personas, teaches you a lot as you're doing it about who you're trying to serve and what they actually need from you. And then the product of that process, those personas themselves, become tools during your design process or during your uh, program development process. So both the, the process itself is useful and the end product is useful as well. And in case you all I've done now is make you ask lots more questions. Don't worry, there are plenty of resources out there. Uh, three of the strongest ones that I've found are up on the screen at this time. Uh, Designing the Digital Experience by David Lee King. He's actually local to you guys, or at least far more local you, to you than to me. Um, he has a section on personas and on this whole process of figuring out who your users are in his book. 
Um, Letting Go of the Words by Jenny Reddish is about writing for the web, and she also talks about creating user personas and figuring out who you're writing for. Uh, but of course, the middle book, The User is Always Right by Steve Matter, is all about this process. And if you really want to do, if you're doing a major redesign of your website or your intranet, um, if you're doing a major renovation or creating a whole new library, this would be an excellent book to get just to see what the process looks like if you're doing it whole hog. And with that, I say thank you. Uh, these are all the various ways of contacting me, either through email, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, my BPL contact email, and uh, on the bottom is my brand shiny new website. It's not quite as fleshed out as I'd like it to be right now, but it's there, and you can certainly contact me and see more about me on there. <laughs> and thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I just want to remind everybody, please feel free to type in a question, raise your hand if you want to ask one via audio. I always kind of take notes as I go along in these things. And so, so this presentation will be your second post on your website, is that? <laughs> on your new website. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I'm a subscriber. I'm, I'm looking for content. Um, what, oh, I, I'm going to add another resource to, to your list, a wonderful list, by the way, especially David's book. I, I have not read the other two, but the moment you started, something flashed in my brain, and I got up from, from behind Krista's desk here, and I went, I'll be right back. And she's looking at me like, what the heck are you doing? I, I ran back down to my office, and one of the books I had on my shelves, which is actually from 1999, um, was called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And it, it, was, it was mostly about software design. But I'm like, man, this personas thing sounds really familiar. And I literally opened the book to a random page and opened to the page <laughs> that said, I did a thing called goal or goal directed design, and it's a whole chapter talking about creating personas. Yep. Um, so I, I I will put that also in our links list for, for, for the archive. But I'm just like, I was just like, oh I I, I know I've read this before. So <laughs> um so the, Go ahead. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. This is a, a process that's been around for decades and decades. Um, it's just there's been a resurgence of interest in it as far as it applies to libraries and how we can start working more efficiently in figuring out who we're trying to serve and how. Uh -huh. So that that's why that's why I've been talking about it lately. Um, also because as web services librarian, I am staring down an internet redesign and a website redesign. And because I've been helping uh, Michael with his um, architectural thesis and another interior design class with their work, and I've just been seeing how universally, uni universally, <laughs> universally applicable looking at your users from this kind of perspective can be. Uh -huh. and, um, and so I've been talking about it a lot. Sure. Okay, so so here are the two questions that, that, that kind of came to me. And the, the first one's a, a bit facetious, but maybe you can address it. Um, anybody who's, who works in a library knows that there are, you know, there's that patron. And, and I will let everybody envision their that patron. Or there's that group of patrons. Is it worthy or of or a complete waste of time to develop a persona around that patron or those patrons? You know, the, the, the problem ones, the, the outliers, the, the should, should we bother taking them into account in this or should we kind of stick more towards the, the mainstream? Well, when you're talking about should you, you know, should you take them into account, of course you should take them into account. You should recognize that they exist. Uh, I said a little at the end of the presentation that the process of creating user personas can be as valuable as the end product. And so by during your process, you're going to recognize those that patrons. Um, a few of our that patrons have actual names and, and online uh, reputation. So we, we've, trust me, we've got a few of those. Um, and, but even if they don't end up being an actual persona that you're designing for, recognizing that they're there and giving them a face and a name can be just as useful because they can also be um, one of those folks that you go to to break your system. You know, you, you can approach your that patron and say, okay, you try using this. If you have no problem with it, then it's obviously going to work for a lot of people because you have a problem with everything. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're that. Uh -huh. But uh, I, I was reminded by uh, 
by my, my boss um, that those folks, <coughs> if they're not a user that you're designing for, they are instrumental in your usability testing later. So if you figure out who they are ahead of time, yeah, if you figure out if you figure out who they are ahead of time during your user persona process, then you make sure that you include them when you go out and test drive a lot of this stuff later. Okay, which which is a perfect lead in to my other question. Um, one of your bullet points, kind of at the end, was test. Can can you just kind of expand on that a little bit as to okay how? <laughs> so the usability presentation is a whole other presentation. But right. Okay. Is, yeah. The the short. I mean, and you want to talk about a field in which there are many, 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 many books on the topic. Um, actually, the the uh, both David's book and the Jenny Reddish uh, letting go of the words talk about usability as well and testing. Um, but it the testing depends on what you're designing. If you're designing a marketing yeah. campaign, then you know. Marketing campaigns have used focus groups from time immemorial to figure out whether or not their marketing campaign is going to work or not. Um, so, if you're talking about a, if you're talking about a program, you can do a pilot run of the program, do it very small, don't advertise it a lot, just really focus in on hand selling it to a few people who represent those user groups, those user personas that you're trying to design the program for, and run it for them. And then if that really works. Now you can start putting it out more broadly. Okay. Um, so may, may, maybe kind of where, so it's not test the personas you created, but test whatever you created based on the personas. Ah. Um, is, that, is that what you meant? So, so you create the personas, based on that you created the website, then test the website, not test the personas. You can also, sorry, you can also, t um, having just gone from the usability of the one to the other. You can test the personas by asking lots of questions during the design process and, and if you seem to be getting wishy-washy answers, then maybe your personas aren't tight enough or maybe they're not distinct enough. Mm, okay. So if you say, is there one, I'm designing this feature of my website, which one persona, I, I'm targeting it for this one persona, is it, is it useful to them? And then just kind of, you know, it's a lot of thought exercises, but also Again, you can run small focus groups or small, um, you know, very tiny, tiny pilot programs to, to test it a little bit. It, that's the sort of thing where you're, it depends on what you're, again, what you're designing for. If you're doing a huge design where your user personas are very important, it, I mean, they're always important, but when they're, when they're really vital to the design process, then you want to do a little more testing. But if you're just kind of brainstorming new summer reading program ideas, um, you can do a little less testing because you're, you've are you probably got a lot of information and a lot of good data that you're already starting with on that sort of thing. So it it's also depends on the data that you've got going in to, uh -huh. to creating your user personas. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions come in uh, from the audience. I, I, I guess I just have one other thought in that uh, just to kind of reinforce for, for the, the, the folks that are attending that are in very small libraries, um, even though, you know, Jennifer is definitely from a larger library, uh, we, sh we shall say, um, you know, maybe, maybe the, the opposite end of the scale to, to, to some of our watchers, some of our regulars, that, you know, even in a really small town library, um, you know, you could probably without too much difficulty come up with four or five personas. I mean, just just with, without without even trying very hard. Um, you know, there's the the mother with the small children, you know, the 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 computer person. The, you know, so so this definitely um, applies, I think, across the board. And mm -hmm. she's she's finding another slide here to to illustrate I this. I'm sure. <laughs> you might not have the sax guy, but you know. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, or you might. You never. Well, know. you might. Yeah. So so to give you an idea, the personas that I created for Michael, for the, for the architectural student, I created while I was the acting branch manager of a smaller branch. Um, you know, this was a 20,000 square foot, okay, 20,000 square foot building. It's the, it's the bigger, smaller branches. Just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was serving a, a single neighborhood of Boston. It was not serving, you know, I was not here at the main building trying to serve hundreds of thousands of people. I was serving a neighborhood 
of, let's say, on a good day, maybe five to 10,000, depending on whether the college students were there or not. And this is still who I came up with. Uh -huh. you know, these are the people I saw in my smaller branch. And this isn't even including the intense researchers, um, the academics, uh -huh. the tourists that they get down here. Um, right. This is just who I saw every day. Uh -huh. So yeah, absolutely. If you're in a smaller organization, a smaller institution, you you can come up with a fair a fair number of personas just based on who you've got. And as I said, you don't want to come up with a lot. You're not looking for as many as possible. You're looking for who you've got. If you only have four users, great. It, you know, if that's all the personas you can come up with, fantastic. That means you can really drill down and do very focused things um, and not worry about the peripheral folks. Uh, one, one persona, though, to always make sure you try and incorporate is the non-users. Uh -huh. Who's not coming in? Who's not using your website? Uh, we just did this for, um, we had a postcard campaign where we dropped postcards, survey postcards at you know, convenience stores and laundromats and places all around the city to try and find out more about why people aren't using the library's website. Um, because we were trying to figure out how to make it better. And one of the steps in that was to figure out who's not using it. And is there anything that we can do to create it, is it, to make something there that those folks would want to use? And what that actually told us, what the survey results told us, is that people just didn't know what we already had. They were perfectly happy to use what we've got, they just didn't know it existed. Mm, and so yep. we're looking at those non-users non and trying to get information about them as a persona, we we figured out things that no it's not what we've got on our website it's that people just don't know it's there. So. All right. Well, Jennifer, I want to thank thank you very much uh, for this. I think there's there's a lot here to think about, if nothing else. <laughs> um, you know, and I am more than more than happy to answer questions later. All my contact information is there. People can absolutely email me. I answer questions all the time. Yep. And and, and as always, we'll we'll be. We'll be posting all of this. Um, we we um, we'll try to find like links to the books and things like that, oh, and yeah. add them to the yeah. delicious and things like that for yeah. for ease. Um, every one of our archive sessions always has a list of links to go with it, so so we'll we'll pull those out mm -hmm. um, and the presentation, obviously. So uh, Jennifer, once again, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, take back control here, and um, and I've just got a few other things. You're, you're welcome to hang out till the end, or if you need to go. Um, uh, you nope, can do can that and, and really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, sure. So let's see. We're going to take back presentation here. Yep. And, yep. We're going to mute you also, Jennifer. So. <laughs> Bye. <Okay. Do> you <laughs> want. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, give us one more sec here. There we go. Okay. So bookmarks. We're kind of running out of time here. Um, I'm just going to, again, highlight a couple of the ones I think maybe are a little more important that people want to know about. You're welcome to investigate these all on your own. Um, one of the things kind of in the, I always have a bit of security news to cover. There's always um, something there's, new. There's always something new. So I'm going to point out a couple of those. Um, the first one here is Facebook. We've talked that they now have a HTTPS mm -hmm. um, version. And I think last month with Google, we talked about the two-factor authentication that you can do where you can get the magic code sent to you on your phone or something like that that you right. have to be able to log in. Well, Facebook is starting to do that now also. Um, it's not in everybody's account yet, but this article will tell you where it is. They're rolling it out. Um, and then every time you log into your Facebook account from a new computer mm. or new device, then you have to use that second factor of authentication. So like the first time you do it from work, first time you do it from home, the first time you do it from your phone, whatever. And that way, if somebody then tries to break into your account from their computer, their laptop at a coffee shop or something, it's a new device and it won't let them in without doing that two-factor authentication. Um, this one, because it's not used every single time, it's just used with a new device, I think I'm going to actually turn this one on for myself. Um, I think that's you know just something uh, interesting to, to take a look at. Um, also in security news, um, if you are a Firefox user, the new version of Firefox version 4, um, along with, I believe, the new IE9, although I'm not 100% sure on this, this there's, some conf there's, 
conflicting methodologies at this point, but there's a lot of talk, even in Congress, about do not track technologies mm -hmm. and legislations. And Firefox 4 has implemented a do not track feature that you can turn on. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean everybody's following it, but it's a start. Okay, so you can turn, you know, if you don't want things, again, companies tracking your information that you visit, um, it can't hurt to turn it on. Let's, let's just put it that way. Um, you know, it might not do any good, but it can't hurt. Um, yeah, um, speaking of Firefox, there is a preview version of Firefox 5 I just got already. Four. I know we just got four. <laughs> there, there is a just rumor, to it. okay, that by the end of the year, we will see five, six, and seven. Why okay, so well... It's, it's kind of like if you're a Chrome user, you probably don't even know what version number you want because it updates itself quite regularly. Mm -hmm. So the, the Firefox is trying to catch up with that faster iteration sort of thing, but they don't have the self-updating yet, so it seems a little more annoying. Um, you know, my copies of Chrome update themselves once every week or two. Yeah. I just don't notice it. Just says restart just, Chrome yeah. and you're done. And then you just have new features and new uh -huh. stuff. Exactly. So and security holes and things like that. Um, Microsoft just did their Patch Tuesday. It was the biggest one ever. There were over 64 critical updates or something like this, important updates. So if you haven't run um, uh, your Windows update yet this month, please do so ASAP. And the last one I will talk about, this was just a cool article. Um, this is um, a great Lifehacker article about getting the dust bunnies out of your computer. Yeah, he's kind of a little dusty bunny now. Um, and it, it, it is pretty good. Uh, it talks about compressed air and uh, making sure you don't breathe while you do that and how to clean the fan. Um, and you can actually make your uh, things even adding a little oil to the fan so it's maybe not as noisy anymore. Um, this is good because I'm always worried about, especially have pets. We've got, oh. I've got cats and we've got ferrets. And I know there's fur all over the house. Yes. Right thing, and I'm a f sometimes afraid to go inside my computer. I know it's in there, and we kind of blow it out with air every now yeah. and then, but this I probably should do more. Pop it open, blow it out, you know, yeah. clean that fan. Um, you know, it, it, it's really not hard to do. Um, it's something maybe once a year you should do. I keep blaming it on Nebraska. Maybe it's because I didn't used to live with pets, and I do now, but I swear, compared to my house in Colorado, my house here in Nebraska is so dusty. Um, of course, there's, you know, three dogs and two cats, but uh, I don't know. I just think there's more dust in Nebraska than there was in Colorado. That's all I guess. That could be. I don't know. It's possible. So anyways, you know, spring clean your computer. Um, I've got a couple other links in here, probably not as important. Uh, I might carry some of them over the next month, but those are the things I, I, I really wanted to get mentioned this time. Um, when we put up the links to for this recording, it will actually link to everything that Michael has here in his delicious, um, not just the ones he mentioned, because you can, as you can right. see, go down, there's more. There's a few more. So you'll have links to other things that you can just read up on um, on your own. Yeah. Oh, and I'll throw in here, too, uh, speaking of the Amazon news, um, there's the ad-supported Kindle that's coming right. out now. 25 bucks off, and you don't get ads in the books, but you get ads in um, the screensaver and the menus, I think, something like that. So... Um, just, it's news. I, I have my own opinions. We'll, we'll stick to that. So, <laughs> okay. All right, um, that's it for me. Yep, it doesn't look like we have any questions about anything coming in just yet. Um, you guys know where to find Michael, though. He's here at the commission, so if you do have any questions about anything that's on his delicious um, account there, um, contact him. Yep, so, yep, I'm around. Send me an email. Yeah, what the heck is this all about? <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer, for being our guest speaker this week. Um, and I hope you will, so we're all wrapped up for today, and I hope you'll join us next week when our um, Encompass Live will be power, The Power of Word of Mouth Marketing with Peggy Barber, um, who's a library consultant who's going to be here speaking with us next Wednesday morning. Oh, yes. Yes. That, that's, that's an event. event. Yes, it is. That is an event. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for attending, and um, we're all wrapped up, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.